on WealthTrack, changing bond markets and the competitive edge of sustainable bond investing. While we believe the Fed is going to be able to hold off inflation or reduce inflation, there's a high likelihood they also could create a policy error by going too far too fast in raising rates. Steve Liberatore, TAA Craft's head of ESG and Impact Fixed Income Strategies, is on Consuelo Mac WealthTrack. Funding provided by ClearBridge Investments, Morgan Le Fay Dreams Foundation, First Eagle Investments, Royce Investment Partners, Matthews Asia, Strategus Asset Management, and Women Investing in Security and Education. Hello and welcome to this edition of WealthTrack. I'm Consuelo Mack. The direction of inflation and interest rates are key to the performance of bond prices, and they are in the midst of a massive change. As this chart from Morningstar illustrates, the shift in direction has been most dramatic for inflation. After a decade of staying mostly below the Federal Reserve's long-term 2% target, the Consumer Price Index recently soared nearly 8% year over year. Meanwhile, until very recently, interest rates have remained near historic lows. Despite telegraphing it would for months, the Federal Reserve just raised its key short-term federal funds rate for the first time since 2018. And the short-term interest rate sensitive yield on the two-year Treasury note has risen accordingly, while the longer-term 10-year Treasury yield has been more subdued. It now remains to be seen how aggressively the Federal Reserve will raise interest rates to dampen economic activity and rein in inflation. Its decisions will heavily influence the performance of bonds, not just in the U.S., but also in the rest of the world. This week's guest will update us on the prospects for the bond markets, but also on the increasing influence of his specialty, sustainable bond investing on performance. He is Steve Liberator, Lead Portfolio Manager and Head of ESG Impact for Global Fixed Income at Nuveen, the investment manager arm of TIAA and a pioneer in the field. Liberator oversees more than $18 billion in public fixed income ESG and impact strategies and investments, including the flagship $7 billion TIAA CREF Core Impact Bond Fund rated four-star bronze by Morningstar. Under his leadership since its 2012 inception, the fund has beaten both the entire intermediate core bond fund category and index. I asked Liberator for his assessment of prospects for inflation and Fed policy. Well, right now, obviously, everything going on in the market is, is purely being driven by a, a lens of what is the inflationary impact of that particular data point, and therefore, what is the ultimate um, reflection into the Fed's reaction function. So inflation, as we all know, is a, is a result of an imbalance in supply and demand. So when we start looking forward, we really have to start looking at where the marginal input is going to come from both supply and demand effects. But also because we've had such a, a spike, a recent spike, we have to start looking at baseline effects as well. So I think what we're going to start seeing next month in April is going to be a rollover of that data. So you're going to start seeing some baseline effects that are going to kind of re repress um, the, the headline numbers and, and the core numbers as well. So you're going to have that as a starting point. But we also have started to see is in the underlying data some improvement, um, especially, from, uh, especially from the demand side, but also from the supply side. You know, so when we think of demand, we think of you know, consumer input. You know, what are consumers looking for and purchasing and consuming within the marketplace? And obviously those, that is primarily driven by the rate of wage increase and savings. And what we have seen is really a slowing in both of those really key categories. In last month's employment report, for example, month over month average hourly earnings was actually flat. So on a month over month basis, that actually came down. And then you combine that with a savings rate that was a little over 26% last May is now down to about 6%. Wow. So in, in, in general, you know, in totality, the aggregate ability of the U.S. consumer, at least, to, to demand and consume more is starting to slow. So you're going to see some improvement on the demand side. On the supply side, we're also starting to see improvement in, in a variety of different metrics. So um, when you look at the Institute for Supply Management, one of the key measures there of um, supply chain pressure is, is called delivery times, the delivery time index. And that number has started to come down and is now down about 10% year over year and is down almost 20% from the peak last year. So that's so a shorter times between when you order something and when you exactly. actually get the goods delivered. Yeah. Exactly. 
And so that generally gives you an indication that the, that the supply chain itself is improving and untangling. And one of the things I think that hasn't been really talked about a lot during the past couple of years during COVID, and really what has been a main driver, I think, of the supply side issue, has been this dramatic, almost a, you know, overly aggressive form of just-in-time manufacturing. Right. So anytime, you know, it was a situation where some supply, some manufacturing companies literally, if they didn't get a truck in on Monday, were done producing by the end of that week. They had that little inventory on hand. So it's gonna take time for that, obviously, to work itself through. So we're also seeing an improvement in the delivery times and, and um, supply from the uh, ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach. So that's another key improvement. And also, and, and this is gonna take a little bit more time as well, but I think it's really important, outside of China, within Asia overall, the loosening of COVID restrictions really has allowed more people to go back to work. So we're gonna to expect to see an improvement in supply chain, which obviously Asia is a key component, especially on the goods producing side. And obviously domestic production here in the U.S. has continued to increase, especially as a result of these uh, supply chain interruptions. So obviously as our COVID situation improves and restrictions um, are reduced, we're gonna be able to get more people back to working. So looking forward right now, based on all of that, I think it's hard to imagine that you and I are gonna be, would, would be sitting here a year from now and talking about how the CPI just printed at 7% or roughly 7% again. You're saying that inflation basically has probably peaked and is rolling over. However, it's still much higher than it was pre-COVID. Absolutely. And and so I'm to talk to us about, you know, what the Fed is looking at if their target was 2% and we're now at 8%. Right. And even though we're rolling over, right. I mean, you know, how much consolation is that and and you know, how are they going to respond to get inflation back down to their target of 2%? And I think that's another factor that makes me feel as though, you know, inflation going forward is going to be a little bit more improved, um, is that the Fed has a very strong historical ability, and they've shown it, to reduce inflation and to fight inflation. Where their track record is a little bit weaker is in the ability to stoke inflation. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it is interesting to me, and maybe it's because we've entered a market environment that for, the, for most market participants, we've never really operated in a persistently rising rate environment. You know, that we've had a very low, moderate flow of, in, of inflation. Almost, it's almost been a Goldilocks type of an economy for the past, you know, almost 20 years at this point. Right, that's a generation of, of on <laughs> Wall Street. Right. Absolutely. So it's definitely a sea change. It's requiring people to, to kind of adjust their, their paradigm and how they've approached things historically. But I do think, just as an aside, I do think it's interesting how concerned we are about slightly higher than normal inflation, even though it has spiked, despite the fact since the great financial crisis until 2020, we had been running at roughly 1% inflation. And, you know, what the Fed had attempted to do was to stoke inflation, to get inflation up to a healthier level, around 2%. And they really had been unable to do that. And I think the Fed is going to do a really good job of, of telegraphing what they expect to do and, and how they expect to do it, because there are a lot of uncertainties in the economy as well as geopolitically that could produce a, a much slower economic growth rate going forward. And the Fed doesn't really want to create a situation where they could have a policy error that tips the economy over into recession. Mm -hmm. But I think that the Fed is in a very tough spot because they do need to slow inflation because the average person is being negatively impacted by the rate of inflation, real wage growth is negative, and that's, that's not a good place to be, especially in the U.S. where your economy is 70% driven by consumer spending. So what we're going to see, I think, is a, they're going to finish tapering. They've initiated tapering. They're going to finish that. They're going to start 25 basis point hikes. And I think depending upon how that goes and how the economy continues to recover and how it responds to those hikes, we're gonna then get a sense of balance sheet reduction. And that'll be a real challenge, especially in the mortgage market, because the Fed has come out and already said that, ultimately, that the Fed really only wants to hold treasuries. So obviously, they've been a big supporter of, of the mortgage market that has right. helped to keep mortgage rates down, which has, in some ways, been a counterbalance to benefit 
um, price stability and price affordability for homes because their policies by lowering rates to the zero bound has really propped up home prices and, and property valuations. So they've almost tried to, to hedge themselves a little bit by being very active in the mortgage market to help affordability from that perspective. The other area that the Fed's been very involved in in the uh, fixed income markets is in the treasury market. And I, you know, I'd heard somewhere recently that the Fed basically owns 50% or more of 10 and 20 year treasury notes and bonds. And if that's the case, that's distorted the level of interest rates in those markets as well. What happens when they start selling them or what happens when they stop buying 10 and 20 year uh, treasuries? And what does that do to long-term interest rates? Right, and, and that's really one of the, again, another challenge that they face is right. in attempting to manage the curve profile that they want, right? In, right, in the, the curve being the, 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 long, the difference between short and long-term rates. Absolutely. Right. And ultimately, in a well-functioning economy and in a healthy market, you want to have a, a normally shaped curve. So your two-year treasury rate, for example, which is most directly impacted by Fed policy, is at the lower end, and your 30-year treasury rate is at the higher end. Mm -hmm. And that's really an important function for the Fed is to keep that curve well p profiled because that's a real major issue for banks and for financial institutions. And, and, and the that, reason it is, is because- They generally, they borrow short term, which is at the lower end of rates, and they lend long term at the higher rate. And therefore, mm -hmm. they're making a spread between where they're borrowing from us as depositors, which is you know increasing slightly now, but still very low, right. and lending out in a longer at the longer end of the curve. So that's an important measure for the health of the financial markets and, and primarily banks. So what they're going to really have to do is be very thoughtful around how they reduce or stop purchasing the treasuries that they currently hold. So how has the bond market absorbed these different challenges that you've just described uh, of inflationary pressures and also the policy challenges that the Fed faces? The shape of the yield curve is telling you that the market believes in the Fed's ability to slow inflation. And that longer term inflation is not going to be at the levels that we're seeing today. And there's a variety of ways to look at that, but one of the ones that I prefer to look at is historically one of the main drivers of inflation and persistent inflation has been people's expectation that there will be inflation. Right. It's almost a self-fulfilling prophecy. And we, we just saw from the University of Michigan today that while one-year inflation expectations is at, at an all-time high, five-year forward, 10-year inflation expectations is at 3%. So much more anchored at the lower end and, and much more in line with historical norms. So I think that how the market has responded is in a belief that the Fed can control inflation and that where we're going to be you know, a year from now, two years from now, is not going to be where we are today. The problem that the, that the curve is really telling you, though, is that while we believe the Fed is going to be able to hold off inflation or reduce inflation, there's a high likelihood they also could create a policy error by going too far too fast in raising rates. So that would obviously then create a yield curve inversion, and an inversion on the yield curve is when the two-year rate is higher than the 30-year rate. That generally is a, you know, that is almost a guaranteed forward-looking data point that we will have a recession within three to six months from the point that that occurs. In addition to that, you would start also expecting to see the initiation of balance sheet reduction. So I think the Fed, the market itself is concerned that maybe the economy just isn't in a, point, a place at the moment that it can withstand the end of tapering, you know, six to seven rate hikes this year, and then also balance sheet reduction occurring all basically within a 12 month period of time when we're still coming out of a, a COVID, a pandemic related slowdown in the economy along with a tremendous amount of other slowing data that we've talked about and geopolitical uncertainties, which also further add to downside pressure on economic growth and future inflation expectations. So what's your assessment at Naveen? I think that we're going to continue to see a flattening of the yield curve. Either the Fed does its job and is able to slow inflation 
um, and therefore bring down longer end inflation expectations, which would then therefore bring down longer end interest rates. Or the Fed doesn't need to do that because the economy is slowing on itself. So either way, I think we're going to see a flattening of the curve. Um, and, and how we're building the, the remaining part is really looking at relative valuations. So we still are uh, still attracted to investment grade corporates, maybe a little bit less than where we were, although they are a little bit cheaper this year as people have moved away from them. Um, we like structured security, so things like asset-backed securities or commercial mortgage-backed securities, because we feel we can get closer to high-quality cash flows mm -hmm. and, and assets. Um, as well as another area we like are taxable municipal securities. We feel there's a lot of quality there underlying that particular market, but again, allows us to get closer to higher quality assets or cash flows. We're up in quality where we're looking for higher, more stable, free cash flow performing entities, organization, pools of assets that we think will do well in a more volatile rate environment as we move forward. What would you describe Bond's role today in uh, one's portfolio? I think that anytime you're pro putting a portfolio together, whether it's specifically a bond portfolio or an individual you know, who's managing their own assets and trying to create their holistic you know, approach to investing, diversification is really the key. And, and while there continues to be correlation between the bond market and the equity market, that correlation isn't one. So as long as it isn't one, the ability to combine those is going to produce for you a better long run output and a long run return. You know, the fixed income side still does provide that ballast to a portfolio, even in this rising rate environment that we're talking about, where we're off to the worst start in the fixed income market since roughly 1980. We're down maybe a little over 4%, you know, in the US, but that's still significantly better than being down 10% in the S&P 500. So, that diversification is going to produce for you a, a better result. Steve, let's get to your specialty, which is uh, ESG impact bond investing. And one of the interesting things that you told me uh, at one point is that you felt that ESG bonds and impact bonds are actually higher quality, lower risk. They're a, a better bet, a better investment than the overall bond market is. So can you explain why? One of the ways that, that we look at this and, and the, the way that I'm managing portfolio is by incorporating ESG analysis and, and consideration of ESG on, on a dedicated basis and impact investments. Mm -hmm. And for us, you know, impact investments are securities that have a direct and measurable social and or environmental outcome. But really, when we think of the ESG concept and how we're applying it, we're, we're looking for and are utilizing as a concept of best of industry class. So what we're doing is evaluating issuers across the fixed income market on a relative basis, on an intra-sector basis, to determine whether or not they are performing the best that they can or not, at the, you know, not in the best group. And the reason that we're doing that is we believe that an issuer that performs well in environmental, social, and governance criteria is simply a, be a better operated and managed issuer. They're taking into account a wider array of risks to their operations and therefore have a more stable free cash flow profile going forward. Therefore, especially in, in while free cash flow is critical for any asset class, mm -hmm. it's especially critical in fixed income where it's an asymmetric payoff. We receive par back for a bond or you can receive zero if it defaults. So when you have that asymmetric payoff, this, the key is how stable are the underlying cash flows that are there in order to repay you. So we believe that those issuers that are doing well against ES and G criteria have taken into account how their operations work, how they can best address a wider array of risk to their portfolio and to their own, oper you know, their own operations. And as a result, are less risky investments going forward. And so that's why we focus so much on ESG, is we believe that there's a direct financial output associated with those criteria, and that helps us to build a portfolio that is more resilient, is more stable. And when you look at impact investments, it's a similar concept. We're looking for businesses or projects, pools of assets that allow for us to invest in 
that over the long run are going to be more stable free cash flow generators, therefore able to have a higher likelihood of paying us back and therefore less likely to underperform because one of the interesting things about fixed income is you don't outperform by picking winners, you outperform by avoiding the losers. Right. And those issuers <laughs> that have a stronger free cash flow profile are less likely to underperform. And has the market reflected your assessment? In fact, have the you know, ESG and impact bonds perform better than their peers in the general fixed income universe? Yeah, I, I think it obviously is a case by case basis, especially right. when you're looking at the at, at active management. So, for example, the flagship fund that I manage, our core impact bond fund, um, is in the third percentile of its peer group since inception in 2012. And I might add that your peer group, at least as far as Morningstar is concerned, is is the intermediate term general bond pop population. That's it's, correct. It's not just uh, ESG bonds. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And I think that what we're starting to see and one of the real benefits of where we have gotten to today in utilizing ESG and impact is we're getting to a place where multiple options now exist that have longer run track records. So you're able to look at 10 year track records and have a more apples to apples comparison where you can look at performance, you can look at risk and you can get a better sense of how those funds are performing instead of only having maybe a one, two, or three year track record, that 10 year track record really is critical and can give people more comfort around the quantitative underpinnings of how we've gotten there from a performance perspective. One investment for a long-term diversified portfolio, what should we all own some of? I think you're always supposed to own some of treasuries, for sure. Um, and I know that that isn't a you know, popular view at this point in time, but what, one of the things that's really important to remember about the fixed income market is the fact that it's considered to be very liquid and highly liquid. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that needs to be remembered is that everything in the fixed income market outside of treasuries is a derivative security because it's all priced on and trades relative to treasuries. It's also the one where there is a significant amount of made markets where investment banks are, are automatically making a market on treasuries. So for an overall portfolio, you want to have that amount of liquidity within the portfolio so that you can take advantage of opportunities as they come up and know that you're able to easily execute a transaction um, one way or the other. Short-term treasuries, in intermediate-term treasuries, long-term treasuries? For most people, it's going to be somewhere in the intermediate. So I would say either the seven or the 10-year treasury. 10-year uh -huh. is the most liquid part of the market. So it has the most, uh, the most float, the most, it, the, it, the most frequently traded securities. And it also benefits from the fact that one of the things that we have um, within the market now is we, we forget sometimes that treasuries are simply a global financial commodity today. Mm -hmm. So another reason why we think that rates are going to remain relatively well grounded in the long term is that people around the world are going to look at treasuries as an investment vehicle. So if you're a Japanese investor, for example, you could be looking at extremely low interest rates. So why wouldn't you own a 10 year treasury on a relative basis, even if you hedged it back? you're earning significantly more than what you earn in your domestic market. The same would go if you're a German investor. So that additional liquidity and demand really benefits the treasury market. So if you're asking from a pure long run tr perspective, I think uh -huh. that's a real benefit as well. Steve Libertor, thank you so much for joining us on Wealth Track, And we look forward to our next conversation, which will go much more in depth into ESG and impact investing and how it's changed and evolving. Thanks, Steve. Thank you for having me. At the close of every wealth truck, we try to give you one suggestion to help you build and protect your wealth over the long term. Look to Winston Churchill for inspiration during Russia's unprovoked war against Ukraine. Once again, I highly recommend a recent book about the World War II leader and one of my heroes. It is The Splendid and the Vile, a saga of Churchill family and defiance during the Blitz. Through firsthand accounts from the great man himself, as well as family, friends, personal staff, and political and military associates, historian Eric Larson captures Churchill's irrepressible spirit, energy, idiosyncratic work habits, discipline, determination, and unflappable leadership under the stress of unimaginable pressures in his first year as British Prime Minister. 
It was 1940 when Britain stood alone against Nazi Germany's undefeated war machine. I also highly recommend listening to Churchill's wartime speeches, a BBC radio recording titled Never Give In, Winston Churchill's greatest speeches put together and narrated by his grandson and namesake Winston Churchill is available online. What better way to rouse our spirits during these challenging and distressing times? Well, next week, leading ESG and impact bond manager Steve Libertor explains how far sustainable bond investing has come and the opportunities available in it. In this week's extra feature, Libertor discusses his involvement in creating the world's first gender lens investing asset class, another impact investing opportunity. When you get a chance, please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and our YouTube channel. Thanks for watching. Have a great weekend and make the week ahead a healthy, profitable, and productive one.